Hi and welcome back to my channel. Today we're going to be looking at a new family called the ethers. Ethers are isomeric with alcohols but they do not have the hydroxyl functional group. Their general structure is that of a carbon chain joined to an oxygen which is joined to a second carbon chain. The two carbon chains may be identical but this is not always the case. For naming, for naming ethers we have two steps. Step one is to find the longest carbon chain. In this example, it would be this chain here, where we have three carbons. That would be the base of the name, so that's going to be propane. Step two is to look at the chain that's attached. We're going to treat this like a branch, but this time instead of ending in YL, it's going to end in oxy. So we have one carbon, so that's meth and then attached to the carbon we have the oxygen, so that's oxy. That goes at the start of the name, so we have methoxy propane. Try to name the following ethers. Pause the video now. So for this first example, our longest chain has one, two, three carbons. So the base of the name for this one will be propane. The branch that is attached has two carbons and the oxygen, so this will be ethoxy propane. For the second example, we have one, two, three, four carbons. So this is going to be based on butane with a branch of two here, so ethoxy again. The final example is a little more difficult. So we have one, two, three, which is propane, but on the second carbon you have this methyl group. So this is two methyl propane. And you have a methoxy group, but that's attached to the first carbon on this chain. So it's 1-methoxy-2-methylpropane. So how do ethers differ from their isomeric family, the alcohols? The first and main difference is that there is no hydrogen bonding between ether molecules. This means that their boiling points are much lower. They can hydrogen bond to water through, through the oxygen, for example. Here we can have the hydrogen bond, but this is only true for the smaller ethers. They're extremely flammable and unstable in air, so they can form peroxides and are explosive. However, they are excellent solvents because they're not very reactive. Preparation of ethers briefly came up in the haloalkanes video looking at the nucleophilic substitution of haloalkanes. This is a two-step process. First of all, you need to produce your alkoxide and then you need to react it with the haloalkane. In general, you would do this in situ because producing the alkoxides is quite a dangerous process. So you take your alcohol that you wish to turn into an alkoxide to be your nucleophilic to be your nucleophile and you react that with a reactive metal such as sodium and this allows you to produce your alkoxide which is this part here and hydrogen gas. You then take your alkoxide and you react it with a haloalkane to produce the other half of your ether. Your alkoxide replaces the X on, from the haloalkane to allow you to produce your ether with the two branches. Your R and your R, your R dashed can be the same or they can be different. If they're different, you have to work out which one you want to use in each re reagent. 
Let's do an example using sodium and ethanol. If we react sodium with ethanol, then you will get sodium ethoxide. which you can then go on to react with, in this case, chloroethane. Chloroethane is a primary haloalkane, so it will react through an SN2 mechanism where your nucleophile attacks, pushing out your halide, forming a five-membered transition state, which will eventually go on to form your ether. Which in this case is a symmetrical ether and is ethoxyethane or diethyl ether. For each reaction, write a reaction sequence, including a mechanism where you can to produce the following ethers. There's possibly more than one correct answer for each of these. Let's have a look at writing a reaction for this molecule. So we wish to produce ethoxypropane. I'm going to start off from ethanol. And react that with sodium to get ethox uh, sodium ethoxide. I'm going to use the ethoxide as my nucleophile in a reaction with propane, right, when in a reaction with chloropropane, which is a primary haloalkane. That means we'll have an SN2 reaction. To produce ethoxypropane. Equally, you could have used propane in the first step to produce your nucleophile and then reacted with chloroethane instead. The mechanism for this reaction is quite similar. I'm going to again use ethanol and sodium to produce sodium ethoxide and then use the ethoxide as the nucleophile. This time I'm going to use bromobutane as my haloalkane and as that's a primary haloalkane we should get an SN2 reaction occurring again. which leads us to ethoxybutane. You could also have used but uh, butanol um, to produce sodium butoxide as your nucleophile, which could then have attacked uh, bromoethane if you wished to produce the same reaction. To do this final reaction, I'm going to use methanol with sodium to produce sodium methoxide. Here we have 3 chloropentane. This is a secondary haloalkane with quite a lot of steric hindrance here, so we're going to draw this one out as an SN1 reaction. 
Then SM1 will have the chloride ion leave the haloalkane to produce a carbocation intermediate. And it's this carbocation intermediate that our methoxide nucleophile can then attack to produce our ether. Thank you for watching my video on ethers. I hope that you found it helpful. Please remember to subscribe and follow me on Twitter for regular updates on new videos. See you in the next one. Bye.